For many parents, competitive sports offer a unique opportunity to help teach children the values of discipline, practice, sacrifice, and teamwork. Sports allow parents and children to share life lessons about the joys of success and achievement, as well as those of disappointment. They can help develop endurance and strength, build confidence and social skills, and help balance a rigorous academic workload. Parents of children in sports programs can also have some peace of mind, knowing that at least as long as their children are out on the playing field, they're out of trouble. Or are they? The increasing incidence of childhood illness, combined with emerging science that links many of those illnesses with exposures to chemical toxins, including pesticides, has raised concerns about the quality of school environments. And the pesticides frequently applied to school playing fields are coming under closer scrutiny for their long-term effects on children's health. There's what we know and there's what we don't know. And what we know already is that lead, methylmercury, a number of pesticides, polychlorinated biphenyls affect the developing brain. And what's equally scary is what we don't know. Simultaneously with the phasing in of these chemicals, which were mostly developed since World War II, we've seen epidemic rises in chronic diseases among American children. Asthma has tripled. Developmental disabilities now affect on the order of 5 to 10 percent of American children each year. Childhood cancers are on the rise, such as leukemias, testicular cancer, among other diseases. Some birth defects have tripled in the past 30 years. We don't know what the causes are of that epidemic, but what we do know is that environmental chemicals are significant factors in the rise of those epidemics. Pesticides used on playing fields can enter the body of a child in three ways. Those which volatilize or are disturbed by heavy activity or strong winds can become airborne, and high rates of respiration among young athletes increase the amount of these toxins which they breathe in. Pesticides can also be absorbed through skin during normal play or when sitting or lying on turf. Finally, chemicals can be accidentally ingested through hand-to-mouth behavior after touching turf or handling equipment and brought inside homes and schools on the soles of shoes, where they can remain active for long periods of time. When a child plays on the ground where pesticides have been sprayed, the child has natural hand-to-mouth behaviors that lead to that pesticide being ingested into the stomach and to the rest of the gastrointestinal tract. It then enters the bloodstream and the brain is still forming billions of connections each day and a lower level of pesticide exposure prevents a certain series of brain connections from being made. Once a toxic exposure occurs, the effects are permanent and lifelong and you can't regain that moment in a child's development. Scientific certainty about environmental toxins can be elusive. Researchers are just now beginning to discover that even at low levels, turf pesticides affect children in unexpected ways. And there is strong evidence to implicate a number of these chemicals as potential culprits in the growing incidence of environmentally mediated disease. As evidence continues to mount, some long-held medical assumptions are being re-examined. We've moved from an era where we were focused on high level exposures or massive intense exposures to the reality that low level exposures to environmental chemicals have equally significant effects on children's health. We know that lead, methylmercury, air pollution, pesticides can all have impacts on children's development even at levels currently considered safe by our federal government. And so it's not the dose that makes the poison anymore. It's the exposure to a wide array of environmental chemicals, even at the lowest levels of exposure, that can harm children's health. While scientists continue to explore the relationship between pesticides and human health, a growing number of schools and municipalities are making the decision to protect children by taking preemptive action. 
Making the switch from a chemical program to a natural turf program is a matter of understanding soil biology and learning how to harness nature's own resources to help create healthy, resilient turf. A directive came down here in town from the local board of health stating that pesticides were a public health issue. And then two years later, what they called an organic pest management policy was put into place, which dictated that all town-owned lands be taken care of without the use of synthetic fertilizers and toxic pesticides. It then became my job to develop a program or a plan that would comply with the request of the Board of Health. At the time we did it here in town, there wasn't a cookie-cutter approach, so we had to take good horticultural common sense a knowledge of our cool season turf grasses here in the northeastern part of the United States and develop a plan that was scientifically sound to grow good turf grass and minimize at the same time the stresses given to us by weeds, insect and disease. There's a huge fear of failure out there, you know, facilities directors that are responsible for large acreages of athletic fields have a fear that if they switch from a conventional program to a natural program that the fields are going to collapse and immediately begin to deteriorate. We've spent the last four or five years here in Marblehead trying to disprove that and we can show that a natural program simply works more with nature and what nature has in place and can in fact produce excellent quality athletic fields. We're in it for the long term. We're doing a feed the soil approach so that soil in turn can nourish that turf grass. Once we take that approach, everything else simply falls into place. Generally speaking, municipal properties and athletic fields are under constant heavy use. Compaction is turf grass's number one enemy. So it's our job at the municipal level if we want to maintain good athletic fields to continually relieve that compaction. We use a natural organic fertilizer. We do a compost top dress, uh, heavy and vigorous overseeding, and then either a core or a slice aeration several times during the growing season. When we combine all of these things around a predetermined program, then we're able to grow good healthy grass. The increasing importance attached to scholastic sports programs has fueled demand for near-perfect sports fields, and many communities have considered the installation of artificial turf as a possible solution. But most artificial turf fields are manufactured using toxic waste products, and recent studies have shown high levels of chemical toxins at field level. Artificial turf requires harsh chemicals for cleaning, and body fluid spills are particularly difficult to handle. Additional concerns about serious and unusual injuries, the disposal of old fields, potential liability, and the loss of environmentally beneficial natural turf has convinced many school districts to choose the rehabilitation of natural fields over the installation of artificial turf. As we learn more about pesticides and their health effects, the demand for natural turf care solutions is growing. Industry is responding with new non-toxic products and turf managers are learning how to maintain beautiful and resilient playing fields without putting the health of children in jeopardy. Every child deserves the opportunity to participate in athletic activities at school and every parent should be able to allow their children to engage in these activities without having to worry. While it may not be possible to eliminate all of the potential toxins which children face in their lives, it is incumbent on us to act when there is sufficient evidence of potential harm. One of the things that's always been very gratifying is when a parent comes up and thanks us for doing what we're doing. You know, there really are people out there that realize that we have an issue here uh, that's a very sensitive issue, but one that we need to look at. You know, we're not against chemicals, but there certainly are ways in our society that we can reduce this chemical cloud that we live under, and turf grass absolutely is one of them. We'll never have 100% evidence that a chemical causes a toxic injury, but we have a responsibility to our children, to our, to our future generations, to prevent that 
unnatural experiment from occurring to prevent toxic exposure so that those children don't carry the burden of diseases in the future. It may be a small investment now, but by taking a precautionary approach to chemical safety, we can make a wise investment in the future of our children.